oldest and strongest human emotion is fear. And the oldest and strongest type of fear is trepidation of the unknown. When we were children, our parents told us that monsters didn't exist. But we were sure that something was lurking under the bed or in the closet. Fear sees even if our eyes are closed. Welcome to the realm of the arcane. My name is Lon Strickler. Join me as I examine unexplained creatures, strange manifestations, and remarkable realities. Imagine this next hour as a voyage of discovery to strange lands, seeking not for new territory, but for new knowledge of the supernatural. Come on board as we begin this adventure together. Hey folks, good evening and welcome to another episode of Arcane Radio, where we explore the unexplained here on the Paranormal King Radio Network. I'm your host, Lon Stricker, coming to you with an cannon shot of historic Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Thank you for joining me. Now tonight, I welcome a few members of the Phantoms of Monsters Fortune Research Team. Uh, we'll ha we have Butch Witkowski, Amy Buell, and... Daniel Eau Claire with us, and uh, this will be an update on some ongoing cases and research and other things, and uh, we'll kind of introduce a few people. I try to get some new people, and every time we do this, uh, we've got, oh my God, I don't know how many people we got in the group now, maybe close to 20, kind of spread around the country a little more, so, uh, you know, when we get people to come on, and uh, people who we know that can do the job, then we... Uh, we go ahead and put them on the team. So it's been working out pretty good so far. So if you have questions, you know, you can go to the chat and post and we'll go from there. So I'd like to introduce you to Daniel Eau Claire. Daniel, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, tell us a bit about what you're doing. Well, hello, it's nice to meet everyone. And it's an honor to be on your team, Lon. And it's, uh, it's great to be here tonight. Um, just wanted to give you a little bit of a background on myself. Um, I have grown up in the northwest corner of Connecticut, and I grew up with a lot of forest around me. I grew up on 65 acres, and very lucky to have a family farm where I did a lot of horseback riding and nature and forest, uh, time in the forest. <laughs> And I went to school for forensics, uh, criminal justice, zoology, and I, that was my focus in my field uh, for criminal justice, and my intent was to become a park ranger and work in the forestry areas. So as I grew up and opportunities presented themselves, I started to kind of focus on nature and investigating kind of the strange things and I branched out into looking into more paranormal and I went to a lot of Ed and Lorraine Warren presentations up in Connecticut. That's where they, that's where they focused their, most of their presentations. I was into paranormal investigations in the cemeteries and I would do a lot of photography, EVP work in the cemeteries, come up with a lot of strange, very, uh, very strange paranormal things in the cemeteries. Uh, currently, right now, I am a member of your Phantoms and Monsters research team, and I'm very grateful for that. And I'm also a member of the ISRT, Independent Sasquatch Research Team, since 2017. And we get out into the field, and we do a lot of our own independent research, and we also do our own uh our own group investigations, which are a lot of fun, really interesting. I've had some very, very interesting encounters. Uh, my first encounter was in uh, Estero, actually. I grew up in Riverton, in the northwest corner, moved down to Florida in 2003 to the southeast corner, of, or southwest, sorry, southwest corner of, uh, of Florida. One night with my first experience, which really kind of launched me into investigating skunk apes down here, I 
had my experience in, about 1030 at night in August of 2006. I was walking my dogs and I came across a very, very strange odor of skunk. And I thought I had never seen skunks before or since in Florida. I don't, I, I just don't ever encounter them. And this was a very strong skunk smell that turned into a very strong fish smell. And then right after that, it turned into what smelled like monkey feces, ape feces. So I thought to myself, what could be out here at night at 1030 at night on a hot August night in Estero, Florida, that would smell like a skunk that's eating raw fish and smelled like monkey feces, ape feces. It was very, very strange encounter. So from there, I contacted the BFRO. I spoke to Matt Moneymaker, and uh, that kind of launched me into kind of checking out skunk ape things down here in Florida. And I looked around to join groups and investigations, and that's kind of what launched me into all of this. Very good. And, you know, we did, we needed somebody down in the Florida area. And of course you did at least one investigation for us recently, which turned out to be a fairly interesting investigation. So hopefully we're going to have more coming your way as soon as everything is lifted where everybody can get out of the house and do something. But, you know, hopefully we can do that. Yeah. I, uh, I had been to monkey jungle, which was a very, very interesting place a few years before that. And that's how I knew what the smell of monkey feces was like. <laughs> oh, okay. It's, it's a very, very unique place. There's no other smell like ape or monkey feces. It's really strong there. When you walk through monkey jungle, you smell them very up close. They're running all around you and you are on the trails and they're just, they're everywhere all around you. So it's a great place to go to do a little bit of research and uh, checking the monkeys and the apes out. I would highly recommend it if you're down here. Excellent. And it's, it's, yeah, it's in the Miami area. And um, so that's how I knew it was a very strong, like a sulfur and skunk smell mixed mm. together. Mm -hmm. And then I had that, that monkey feces smell. So that kind of really, really launched me into my investigating and, you know, interest in everything. But of course it all started back in the 1970s and 1960s with the Patterson-Gimlin film, of course, it launched a lot of people into being really interested in the field. So. Well, we are very pleased to have you with us, and uh, I know for a fact that you will do a lot of good work for us. And, uh, you know, we've, we've all been talking back and forth now for a couple of months at least, so... Uh, like I said before, as soon as we can get out, we're going to get some stuff going. So, uh, Amy, why don't you tell, tell us a bit about you? I know you've been on the show once before, but, uh, kind of give us a brief overview. Sure. Um, first I want to thank Danielle because she's really the reason you and I started talking to each other. You know, she was like, you need to talk to Lon, Lon, you need to talk to Amy. So, Thanks, Danielle. <laughs> You're welcome. A um, <laughs> um, little bit about myself. Well, I am a, I call myself a Bigfoot enthusiast. Um, I'm an investigator as far as, you know, I, I, I read about, I look into these um, reports. I spend a whole lot of time looking into Bigfoot. I used to be, Daniel talked about the BFRO. I used to be an investigator for them. But I like to say I kind of graduated out of that and into my own into my own nook. Um, I am a part of the Olympic project that's out in Washington State. I live in Ohio, but I travel out that way as often as possible, and I'm kind of starting some new things up out this way with them. I am the co-founder of Project Zoo Book, which is what I'm most excited about. Well, one of the, I'm excited about a lot of things, but one of the things I'm most excited about, um, it's a group um, kind of under the radar. We don't have a lot of presence out on, you know, in Bigfoot groups or anything like that. We're just doing our own thing, but it consists of um, several Bigfoot researchers alongside of scientists, and we have several zoologists, primatologists, a marine biologist, a regular biologist, anthropologists, um, a lot of ologists <laughs> that we're working with and 
trying to discover new things about Bigfoot as a possible primate. And I always like to kind of inject in there that I don't know if that's what Bigfoot is. I've had a few maybe experiences, nothing, no smoking gun where I can 100% say that what I experienced was Bigfoot, but I believe or I think so. And um, I'm just curious. I, I'm fascinated by the science that um, is going on. And a lot of people don't know that there's a lot of science going on, but there really is in the, in the search for this creature. But I know a lot of people who have had other experiences that don't quite sound like a natural animal. So um, I, I feel like you should go where the evidence leads you. And if it goes, you know, an offshoot somewhere else, then I'm okay with that. But um, my interest is looking at it as a possible primate. Um, I also have my own little thing called Able Amy's Bucket List Expeditions, where I do things for Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts and um, a lot of stuff with kids. I, today was my last day as a teacher this year, and maybe I'm not sure if I'm going to um, be going back next year or not. We're, we're uh, that's kind of waiting to see. But, um, you know, I'm not sure because there's a bunch of changes in Ohio with licensures, and I'm just not sure if I want to go through all of that. <laughs> thing, but, but I am a teacher, and, um, you know, I, I, I tell my kids about Bigfoot and you know, try to get them to look into the evidence and see for themselves. A lot of, a lot of my students like that. So I do that as well. I, um, I am an OCVN, which is Ohio Certified Volunteer Naturalist, because once I started getting into Bigfoot and going out into the forests across the country, I really felt like I should be a little bit better prepared. So I took classes through the Ohio State University to learn more about the flora and fauna of Ohio specifically, but it translates into other states as well. Um, I also take bushcraft classes with the Midwest Native Skills Institute, and I take my um, teaching kind of on the road these days, except not anymore this year. A lot of things have been canceled, but mm. myself and some of my um, research partners, we've been doing a lot of outdoor shows, like hunting and fishing shows, until the virus hit where we are getting a whole lot of encounter stories from hunters and fishermen. And I, you know, the first one I did, I wasn't sure really how it was going to go, if I was going to get tomatoes thrown at me or something, but <laughs> I, I can't tell you how many people have come up to us and told us their stories. It's been great. So that's, that's kind of what I'm doing. One more thing I'm doing is um, I, since today was my last day of school, I am going to be focusing, as I look for another job, I'm going to be focusing on finishing up my book that I'm writing on Tom Page, who a lot of people in the Bigfoot community have not heard of, but he was a financial backer for Roger Patterson and Peter Byrne um, in the late 60s um, before Roger died. And he is a gentleman, he passed away this year, but I spent a couple of years meeting up with him and getting his stories and um, with his blessing and that of his family, putting it into a book. So there you go. Well, that sounds know. very interesting. You know, you, yeah. you were talking about fishermen and hunters. And yeah. I, I tell you, I used to get in the springtime when trout season would open up here in Pennsylvania, I, I would, I would always expect to start getting a few Bigfoot reports. Because mm -hmm. it, it always happened. I mean, somebody would say, I was out today, first day of trout season, and I saw this and that. And uh, it, it did happen a lot. So, yeah, they, they, you know, they are a good source. They definitely are. They really are. I'm, that first one I did, I, I was crawling around, like, taping the carpet down for my booth. And I looked up, like, this was the night before it all started. And there were, like, five guys standing there waiting to tell me their stories that were just other... <laughs> vendors and stuff yeah. and i'm like oh my gosh i wasn't expecting that yeah yeah they are a good source so um my old war horse butch wakowski and everybody knows butch butch and i've been together for my god i guess at least five years now i don't know how long has it been butch seems like forever <laughs> yeah, it does yeah i got old butch involved in all this cryptid stuff now he's uh 
he's blaming me for him going crazy now. <laughs> but uh, uh, what's been going on with you, Butch? I know you, you're ready to get out there and, and to look into at least one of these cases we've been we've been kind of talking about. But uh, what's going on? Well, we got, uh, of course, uh, we've been since this uh, virus thing started right before that. I mean, we were gearing up to hit the, uh, you know, the caves and a couple uh, abandoned towns here in Pennsylvania where we had bipedal canine sightings and, you know, just scout around there and see if we can come up with anything. And then, of course, we wanted to get back to Clearfield because that's where we had our very first two cases and they still have some issues going on up there. Um, the case uh, that's of interest now is uh, since I moved from Lancaster to Berks County now, I'm closer to French Creek State Park, which is where we go test our equipment during the uh, uh, early spring, uh, make sure everything works. And uh, we got a case down there of, of, well, I guess they're describing it as a rake, but not really. So yeah. they don't know if it's why. We don't know what know, these things are. Yeah, well, you know, rake was originally folklore from England. And uh, it was basically uh, put out uh, to keep little kids in line. You know, yeah. Uh, yeah. if you well, don't go do to it. bed early, yeah, if you don't go to bed early, you don't need all your peas, the rake will take you. So uh, then a movie came out in 2003. It didn't really catch on much. And then 2018, I believe, was the second movie. And it was off and running. So people are seeing rakes everywhere. Um. But the one down in French Creek, uh, being that we go down there a lot to test equipment and stuff, and it's a it's one of the darkest areas in Pennsylvania. It's like the second darkest in Pennsylvania, other than Cherry Springs. And um, so checking out night vision and thermal imaging and stuff is really good. And we got to know all the rangers and stuff down there, but they're closed, so I can't really get down and talk to anybody yet. So as soon as they open, I talked to the one sergeant, and he said, hey, come on down. You can talk to all the guys at one time. Mm -hmm. So I want to do that and see if they have any reports of anything strange running around. Now, there have been Bigfoot reports in the past, but they go back into the late 50s, mid-60s, and then it just kind of dropped off. Um I still do a lot of uh, UFO. Uh, I still do a lot of human mutilation investigation. Um, but it's uh, just so slowed down now because of this virus. You can't go anywhere. Yeah. So everything you're doing, you're either, you know, I'm either going scouring through reports in the library or, you know, I'm, I'm on the Internet trying to track something down or talking to other investigators. So as soon as we can get out there, I mean, of course, I got the farm up there in Lancaster County. Where you were at, that's still yeah. going on. That's still going on. So, you know, we have some of these cases that we, we can't even name what they are. You know, yeah. they're entities. Uh, and I'm one of those guys that believes all this paranormal stuff is all connected, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and it has to be. It's just, it's just logical. And, uh, you know, we just have this thing about, you know, think critically and demand evidence. Well, that's, that's just good. it. Yes. Yeah. yeah, and you know, we and you know, we got a question here in the chat about how we determine an investigation needs to take place. Well, basically, I, I would say that that has to do with what we're you know, what the description of what people are seeing or what they experienced. Uh it it does seem that we do receive a lot of bizarre cases for whatever reason. Uh, and you know the fact that we're getting these these tall, white, skinny humanoid type cases, and we got one out in uh, one of our other investigators is looking into one out in Allegheny County. We had you know had about two weeks ago that was sent to us. So you know Pennsylvania has been getting more and more of these sightings. Uh, I had Stan Gordon on here a couple weeks ago. He mentioned that he's been receiving similar type sightings, but this is this is a phenomenon that's been going on all over the country in recent years. But it, it does seem to be something that's more, you know, it'd be more prevalent. 
Uh, Danielle, have you heard of anything similar like that going on down your way? I have not. Um, most of my focus has been in the central Florida area near the Green Swamp Wilderness Preserve here, uh-huh. where uh, there's a lot of skunk ape sightings here. And I created a DNA kit with my forensics background and criminal justice. So I purchased things from the police forensics supply house. Oh, okay. And yeah, so I am prepared when I get a call or I need to do an investigation or I'm out hiking even. I bring the DNA kit. I'm, I'm always ready with that and my casting materials. And uh, no, it's mostly mostly here a skunk ape. I really haven't heard much about, about those at all here. But it's, uh, <laughs> Yeah, it seems like the only humanoid cases we have gotten down your way are those winged humanoids. Uh, the yeah. gargoyle settings down in Pasco County. That's a little yes. further south of you i think but uh, uh yeah that's out to my west yeah and uh, i didn't investigate that i did drive out there but i did not find anything any evidence or any anything that i saw yeah that's uh that's something that's been going on uh as well as uh around marion county and around the um the state forest ocala around there as well we've heard some reports in there so uh I don't know. Maybe I'll get one to send you out on sometime soon. Hopefully. I hope so. Yeah, yeah. I hope so. Yeah. I, I really like that Ocala area, and that's next on my investigation list because there's a lot of wilderness up there to explore yeah. and uh, a lot of hiking trails and a lot of strange stories. Looking forward to it. I'm excited for the future. So, Amy, have you heard of any of these humanoid sightings your way? Not really. I did a little um, report, if you want to call it that, for a a Paranormal Road podcast. And most of the reports were actually, you know, Chicago. Um, It was more the winged things like you're talking about, too. But I, you know, I am learning so much from you and your group because, like I said, I was really just into Bigfoot. And then all the stories you guys talk about, I'm like, oh, man, I don't want to see those out there. <laughs> but, but, but it's fascinating, isn't it? But no, I, I don't know of any right in my area. Okay. And you're in, you're in Youngstown area around there? Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mahoney yeah. County. So you do make your way over to Pennsylvania sometimes as well. I sure do. I'm I'm making some plans right now. Actually, after this, I'm still um I have my maps open. I I use the internet a lot, but I also like paper maps still. And oh, okay. um, we were talking before. I I go out quite a bit to the Allegheny National Forest. I grew up going to my grandpa's hunting cabin out there, and. So this summer, since most of my other things have been canceled, I'm planning on spending quite a bit of time there. Excellent. So, Butch, have you been hearing anything else? Uh, any other reports coming your way? How about some UFO stuff? Well, UFO sightings, yeah, we you know get a couple of those a week. Um, a lot of them right now seem to be north uh, in New York area, New York State, upper New York State. And uh, our friend Dave up in British Columbia, uh, he's gone out on a uh, bipedal uh, canine uh, trek on Sunday. Is it? Uh, I sent him some, uh, he requested some uh, footprint pictures and what he should be looking for track wise. And so I sent those out to him. So I'm wishing him a lot of luck and I hope he's safe. Because yeah. up in his area, up in his area, walking down any trail and running into a bear the size of a Mack truck is yeah. not an issue. <laughs> I mean, there, I you know, he keeps wanting me to come out there, and I keep thinking, nah, I don't want to be Sunday. I don't want to be a Sunday brunch, you know. <laughs> He's um, told me some stories of some of the some of the encounters he and his friend have had up there, and uh, yeah, it's uh, it's pretty hairy up there. Yeah, well, you know, when you read some background research, that area, British Columbia, I mean, besides missing people by the hundreds, they have, you know, uh, many Bigfoot reports. They have many uh, reports of strange creatures running around, especially in around lake areas around British Columbia. And, um, you know, the, there's logging trails that take you everywhere. And usually they take you back in the woods so far, you know, you don't even see daylight anymore. Yeah. 
But uh, UFO reports are eh, they're about average right now. Uh, they'll pick up when people can get outside again and start looking up. Uh, we have had some really good clear skies, so I, you know I check that all the time. But um, that uh, some strange reports that I, you know I don't even know where to put them in a category. So you know, make the calls, uh, see what we can pull up on them, and uh, follow them from there. But right now, the uh, bipedal canines and uh, UFOs, and of course, human mutes are all top of the line. Mm. But we've been getting some really strange stuff. I mean, yeah. you know, through phantom, through phantoms and monsters, you know. Yeah, we have been getting some strange reports. Um, now, I'm going to come to you, uh, Danielle. We got a question in the chat room. Uh, gentleman wanted to know, how many different Bigfoot species are there? What do, what do you think? That, what do you think is going on there? Do you think that there are are specific species or the characteristics are just more different in different areas? I have no idea. I, uh, I, I like to approach it as a flesh and blood creature. Uh That's all I know. I mean, from, from what I've heard from firsthand accounts that it looks more human from what people have told me from Mm -hmm. my, from my experience, it smelled, like I said, like an ape or a monkey Mm. that was Mm -hmm. the distinct odor i've never laid eyes on one unfortunately Mm. i'm hoping i mean that's that's everyone's goal of course but um there's it's impossible to say how many species but i would say you know it seems to be pacific northwest is the big muscular very tall very broad shouldered and the skunk apes down here seem to be a lot more lean um, just from what I'm hearing, you know, I, I, yeah. like I said I have no idea. I, you know, nobody's ever found a body yet, so there's no way to know. Yeah. So. How about you, Amy? What do you think about that? You know, I I kind of agree with Danielle. I, I mean, I know of different researchers who have come up with whole. Um, you know, you can look at it. there's this species, this species, this species, all these different types and things. I don't know if I buy that without having a body or body. No. Um, I'm not saying I, that they're wrong and I'm right. I just, I need a little bit more than that. But besides, um, you know, I, I was going to say exactly what she said about the differences between the sightings out in the Pacific Northwest and then in Florida or even, you know, the Midwest. But um, it's kind of, to me, it's kind of like you go to Africa, you have, lowland gorillas you have mountain gorillas you have cross river gorillas on the border of nigeria and cameroon they all are the same you know animal they're just like subspecies i guess they have a little bit of differences but they're they're the same but who knows i mean you have different cryptid um primates in the world you have the orang penduck you have the yeti um but as far as bigfoot you know as a species i think we would have to uh find them you know you know have yeah. a little bit more evidence to be able to say yeah i mean unfortunately all we can do is go by anecdotal evidence of what people are actually seeing and reporting right. and uh you know it does seem to me now i've said this before but it does seem to me that the um the creatures that are being seen out in the pacific northwest are are in my opinion most likely indigenous, and and it, and they do seem to hang around in, in pods or family groups more so than they do in other parts of the country. Uh, and I'm just going by what I, ha- you know, by the evidence that's been presented to me. Right, uh, right. But you, of course, now you you know you talk about the skunk apes, and they they seem to be a shorter type, like more like an orangutan looking thing. I don't know looking wise, but the, the hair. The long hair, the size. Uh, as you go around the Gulf Coast, it kind of changes somewhat. Uh, you get into some bigger creatures. And then up our way here, you know, very rarely do you hear of any more than just one being seen at a time. Um, you know, very rarely we get family groups that are being seen. Uh, That's true. You know, why are they, uh, you know, solitary? 
I don't know. I mean, you know, of course, I, you know, you know how I think. I, I think there's some supernatural aspect to these creatures. Uh, you know, I, I think they're, that, you know, especially in areas like here in this part of the country, in the Mid-Atlantic and even into the Midwest, there may be something to that. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. What do you think, Butch? Well, I, you know, I, I'm still puzzled by the reports. And we've talked about this before. Uh, the Bigfoot reports where there's a, a flash of light is seen in the wooded area, wherever the creature's seen. And the, the more I looked into that, the more reports there are. There's a lot of reports of that where there's a flash of bright light and the creature appears or is seen. And then there's a flash of, a flash of bright light and, then, and it disappears. Now, you know, does that lend a lot of credence to, you know, interdimensional whatever or the other the jour of the day with that stuff. But I just find it kind of strange that those, some of those reports are, uh, are really originated out in the, out in the Northwest. And then, you know, you have them in the Midwest and you have them here now, not so much here as you do out there in the Midwest. I mean, in the uh, Northwest, but that to me is strange. I do believe they're a flesh and blood creature. Um, the Bigfoot sightings here in Pennsylvania, with the exception of the Chestnut Ridge, which, you know, just reports out there all the time. But we have uh, in kind of like in, in my area, your area, they're very slim. Um, but then when you get to north central Pennsylvania, then it goes from the Bigfoot and it goes into the bipedal, mm-hmm. uh, you know, from the Allegheny Forest, all the forests. I mean, in our Lichen Loop. I mean, we have, what, 60 reports now or 61 reports. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's a lot, yeah. you know. Uh, I mean, it, even though it's spread out over four years, five years, it's still a lot of reports. And then that doesn't count the background reports. I mean, you know, uh, like the report from 1868. <laughs> I mean, how do you uh, – people say, well, how do you know? Well, how do you explain a report in, in 1868 where a farmer encounters a bipedal canine that's attacking his uh, flock. He shoots, it takes off. He goes into the town. He describes it to the constable. Uh, the constable tells it to the newspaper, which was the Erie Gazette or something like that, Erie New Era. I don't know what it was. And they print the exact same description that we're getting now. Yeah. 1868 is a long way off. <laughs> yeah, I mean th- th- these these creatures that were that people are reporting, in particular here in Pennsylvania and in, and in Maryland and yeah. a few areas, uh, they're always described as huge creatures. I mean, nine to ten foot, yep. and uh, you know <laughs> that's why I, I started calling them lichens because I. I you know, when you start hearing these reports, it's not just like the underworld lichens when, you know, people talk about them with the size and everything. These things are humongous and they they help, they stand their ground. Uh, you know, I never want to run up against one of them, to be quite honest with you. So I don't know. I don't know. Well, you know, it's uh, you know, I, I do believe I, I, I do believe a lot of these cryptids. And just not Bigfoot, but a lot of all of them may have some some aspect to them that's paranormal or supernatural. Uh, you know, just like what's going on in Chicago. I, I I do believe that there is some supernatural aspect to those as well. Uh, you know, what do you think? What do you think, Daniel? Well, I try to keep a very, very open mind with my investigations, and I'm open to any possibilities, but I try to approach things with a skeptical eye as well, and I try to take out any any outside influences that could be throwing me off, something that could be not, you know, just, it just it, it makes it, like I said, I try to approach it with a flesh and blood and if there's other strange things, how do you how do you even measure something like that? I don't know. I, you know, I've had friends who've had very unusual experiences, very very unusual, and you just can't get the evidence. You can't. There's no way to, 
you know, capture that evidence. So what I try to do, like I said, I, I bring my DNA kit, I bring my casting materials, I try to get physical evidence, uh, try to get photos, try to get EVPs, or I try to get some sort of recording. And right now that's the best I think we can all do. And until there's some definitive hair and DNA and things like that, you know, that's, that's the best we can do. Well, I, I will tell you one thing. I tell everybody that comes into our research team, you're going to probably hear some of the strangest things you've ever heard before. You really are, because I, I tell you, I'm, I'm at the point now, I'm not really surprised with what I get, you know, but the only thing I can do is put it out there for our people to look it over and to give their opinions. And if they're close enough to go investigate, and that's what we've done. You know, we did, we started doing this with the sightings in, in Chicago. And uh, I had a question here about the O'Hara sightings. Well, you know, that, that is an area that most of the sightings in Chicago have been coming from. But lately, and I don't know, Butch, it's, March was probably the last one we had, maybe February. So yep. uh, I don't know. And it has to do with things being closed up. Uh, mm -hmm. I think when they get the airports going again, uh, there may very well be some more sightings. Uh, you know, one of the one of the... One of the things Lon leads credence to these animals being, uh, well, animals, creatures, being flesh and blood is that, you know, why would a bipedal be chewing on roadkill? Oh, yeah. Something interdimensional wouldn't need to eat. Well, that's true. And we have, you know? had, we have had those sightings. But then sure. again, we've also had sightings where they just suddenly appear or disappear, or they have an aura to them that just isn't natural. Uh, right. Yeah, I mean, we may be dealing with, with something that's uh, that is flesh and blood as well, supernatural. Yeah, you know, we've always mm -hmm. considered that. Yeah, that's why I, you know, that's why I'm just a firm believer in the only way, you know, unless we get a body, which is <laughs> slim to none. Yeah, uh, is uh, you know using thermal imaging and getting them on a thermal image, and then we can take it from there. But it's uh, uh, digital photographs aren't going to work because, you know, everybody will say you doctored it. So thermal imaging is going to be the best way to go. And, um, of course, tracks, uh, which, you know, I'm thinking of getting a portable scanner that I can scan them right on the scene. And right. I, mean, I can send them out to you. I can send them to Dr. Meldrum. I can send them anywhere I want to send them. Right. Plus, plus, I don't have to carry around 10 pound of <laughs> dental stone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really. Yeah. So, uh, Amy, what up? What are the hot areas in your, in in Ohio where you've been looking at over the years? What um, where do the majority of your reports come out of? My reports, I, I do get a lot from PA from the Alleghenies, like I said. But as far as Ohio, my biggest hot spot where I spend a whole lot of time is down in Columbiana County. Um, I right around Beaver Creek State Park area. Um, you know, that's a, it has a big history of Bigfoot sightings. So, uh, I'm not really surprised that I get calls from there, but it's where the Ohio Howl was originally recorded and, um, there's still activity going on to the present times. I just, I've had a couple, um, reports over the last year that have come in from people and, um, you know, every once in a while, you still get one. I, I did a uh, Bigfoot day down for Beaver Creek State Park the past couple years and um, helping them to um, raise money for their friends of Beaver Creek. And every time there's people that show up last year, last fall, there was a gentleman who I can't say his name, but he's a um, political figure from that area, I'll just say. And he... Um, wears that he saw one you know and we've talked quite a few times and you know I don't really blame him that he doesn't want to come out and and say that he's seen Bigfoot because maybe he won't get elected again <laughs> but 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 then again <laughs> you know it's like I'm hoping that someday you know that people won't feel like they have to hide that you know people yeah. ask me as a have I ever gotten any flack for it? And my answer is always, I wouldn't care if I did. You know, I've, I've experienced what I 
have experienced. I don't make things up, but I also don't take away from what I've seen or heard, you know? And so I'm not ashamed of talking about Bigfoot. You know, I've lost friends over it. Mm. Some of my family thinks I'm crazy, but I don't really care. <laughs> yeah, I guess, you know, I mean, it, it's just what I'm interested in. But yeah, Columbiana County has a lot. Um, if you go out to West Branch State Park, there um, are a lot of sightings there. And I have some good friends, good researcher friends that, that spend a lot of time in West Branch. You have the Cuyahoga Valley National Park area. Again, a lot of rich history there. Um, some of my favorite sightings come from that area in Cuyahoga mm -hmm. Valley. Um, so that's where I frequent. I do go out to Salt Fork quite a bit, and, um, you know, it's always fun. That's that's a well-known area, but most of my time and and my um, sighting reports that I get are from closer to PA. All right. And, Danielle, you've been, to, you've been done work on Salt Fork before, too. Yes, uh, that's where I had my second encounter, in fact, after the Astero <laughs> encounter. When I was at Creature Weekend for 2017, I went on the trails by myself. I got there a few days before the conference started, and I wanted to go out and check out the trails and see if I would have any encounters because, you know, like Amy was saying, it's a very active area. There's a lot of sightings. So I thought, well, you know, I'll just take my cell phone out with me. It didn't, didn't have any equipment or anything. And as I walked along the trail that's kind of up behind the resort or the lodge, I, um, I came to the top rise of, a tr of the trailhead, just came over the top of the trail. And as I came over, I was the only one out there. There was nobody else around because it was the very beginning of the, of the conference, like a couple of days before. And I had been one of the first people to get there. And as I came over the top of the rise... I heard two very, very heavy footsteps and a foot drag, and it was only between 50 and 100 feet away, and it sounded like something had ducked behind a tree, and it was a very open area. So I knew I was out there alone. This was very deep forest uh, leaves and trees, and there was just nobody around. I could see clearly all around me, but it was it was very heavily, heavily forested, and there was just, there were no people, there was no voices, nothing. So this thing had taken two really heavy footsteps and this foot drag. So I knew it was around me. So I paused and I sat there for a couple minutes and just kind of listened. And then I tried a whistle. And after the whistle, I walked another 50 feet, paused, did another whistle, didn't get a response, walked another 50, 100 feet, did a whistle. And I got what sounded like that knocking noise. Uh -huh. And I was completely shocked. Completely, completely shocked. Did not expect it. I was just out there alone. Had no expe zero expectations. And when I got <laughs> what everybody says is that knocking sound. To me, it sounds like what a gorilla does. When the gorilla beats on its chest and it, you hear that popping noise, that to me was exactly what it sounded like, that popping sound. So... If I had to guess, I think it's something on their body that they're doing. I don't think they walk around with a stick and beat on trees. That's just totally my opinion. But, mm -hmm. you know, I think it's part of their body, like, like the gorillas when they're showing their, you know, their territory or their dominance, they beating, they're beating on their chest. So, you know, that's just my theory, but that's what I heard. And I was very close to it. It was within 50 to 100 feet was a very clear sound to me, but it didn't sound like it was on a tree. It sounded like it was on its chest or on a some sort of, I don't know, body body part. Mm. So after that, I try, you know, I stood there for a few more minutes and tried to interact, but I didn't get any more responses. And I was kind of nervous because I was out there alone and I wasn't sure if it was going to be aggressive or not. So I, oh uh, yeah, yeah, I, I I was a little bit nervous and I had never been so close to one before during the daylight hours like that and interacting with it. So I, I turned and went back to the lodge cause I got, I got very nervous and I didn't have any, any protection on me. So, but it was very exciting. And that was my second encounter. So oh. yeah, yep. it was very, well, very exciting. 
I, I tell you, you know, there, there was one aspect of my encounter back in 81 that I, you know, I've heard people try to explain it to me. Uh, I heard a ticking sound. This thing was actually making a ticking sound. And I've always thought that it may be gnashing its teeth. Uh, I don't know if it was a nervous thing. It was chattering somehow. Uh, but it, 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 did, it did do that. Uh, have you all heard, any of you heard of that before? No, I, I have heard, heard, you know, it's a zoologist that I work with talking about, you know, how they can grimace their teeth and kind of um, grind them. But I'm not sure about the ticking sound, but that's the next thing I'm going to ask them about. Yeah, because this thing was, um, he was about 30 yards from me, I'd say, thir between 30 and 40 yards from me. You know, we were standard locked eyes on each other. And I was hearing its clicking sound and I, I didn't know where it was coming from. I, you know, at the time, but I, I've, I've, as I thought about it later on I, and, and talked to people, they, they had stated, well, it, it may be actually either ch chattering or clicking its teeth together or gnashing its teeth. So, but I know that it did that to me. So I don't, you know, that's something different. Hey, Lon, can I, can I say something? Can I interject sure. something here? This is Amy. Um, when you guys were talking about, you know, Bigfoot being a natural creature versus maybe something paranormal, mm -hmm. I just wanted to say um, another thing that I do, I co-founded with my research partner, Tina Sams, um, an event called Creekfoot. And it is in Columbiana County, Ohio, where a lot of stuff goes on. And we have it twice a year. Our spring one got uh, canceled this year because of the virus. And we're crossing our fingers that we can have the one in the fall. But it's very inexpensive. It's just like $5 a night to camp. Um, so we're not making any money uh, off of it or anything. We, we do try to raise some money for the campground itself. But anyway, the reason we started it was because there was always so much fighting between groups of bigfooters or just individual people about no it's an animal no it's paranormal and and like danielle said and i think you too um but there we have people who say both or one or the other and maybe everybody's right you know i always say that if something is labeled paranormal maybe it's just science we haven't figured out yet we just don't exactly. know how it works and yeah so, right I, we wanted to create a place, an event where from the person who is like way outside the box on one end to the other end can come there and feel comfortable talking about their opinions or things that they've experienced and really learn from each other. So um, I think it is so important. You know, I don't make fun of anybody, however far out what they have seen, you know, what they say they've seen. Because maybe they have seen it, and maybe we just have to figure out how to explain it. I think that's really yeah. important. What do you think, Butch? Oh, I, I think that's great. <laughs> uh, just keep us updated on what it is. I'll drive my butt out there. <laughs> okay, great. I will let you, I'll let you guys know on our chat. <laughs> well, you know, this is something, you know, this is a debate that's been going on for, well, you know, Ever since I've been involved with it, I mean, I, I mean, back in the nineties, uh, I was even preaching this and, uh, you know, I, I would get scaffold at, you know, people would look at me and think I was crazy. Uh, you know, th there were two separate camps. Uh, one camp was bigger than the other one, but I think recently in recent years, more and more people that get involved with the Bigfoot research and as, and a few People that have been doing this for a, a great deal of time have actually started to be more open-minded about it. Um, you know, I, I don't. I run, know. I run pretty fast from people who think they know everything. That's all. You well, know. you know, just like everything else, there's no experts in this. You know, in the paranormal. That's uh, right. You know, I, I I hate it when I go into a radio show and somebody says uh, he's an expert at this and that. Well, there's no experts in this. You know. But, uh, you know, we're all working on opinions and conjecture for the most part anyway. The only thing we can go on is what the evidence is presented to us. And to try to make an assumption 
to the best of our ability. But no, I mean, we just really don't know what a lot of this is. We don't. I always think about that movie. I forget when it came out several, several years ago. The the gods must be crazy where the yeah. pop yeah. gets thrown out of the airplane and the natives think, oh, you know, this is supernatural. And, and you know, it's, it's always, it's sometimes probably just a matter of how you look at something. Mm. So, uh, let's see. Uh, now, hopefully we're all going to be able to get out in the field soon. So, let's let's go around the table and kind of uh, see what our first priority is. Daniel, what do you plan on doing as soon as you can get out? And I know you haven't been out a bit, but as soon as you can get out and do more. Well, I just got back from the Ocala National Forest. I did kind of a... Uh, preliminary investigation up there to see which areas I'd like to check out in the future. And it's a huge, huge area up there. A lot of, lot of, lot of wilderness, a lot of forests, a lot of places to explore. Um, as things are starting to open up here again in Florida, um, I'm very lucky to be here in central Florida next to this uh, green swamp wilderness preserve. Um, it is 560,000 acres for just the green swamp wilderness. Mm. And there's a ton of places to explore. I'm very excited to be next to it. I'm literally right across the street. I cross my street and I'm in into the green swamp. <laughs> and there's a ton of sightings there. And um, I'd like to go back up to the Ocala National Forest sometime. They're starting to open up more trails there and more hiking and more investigating up there. Uh, and that's going to be probably in the next few weeks. I, I'm trying to prepare myself now. I'm going to invest in a parabolic dish and some more equipment for the, for the field. I do have a dash cam that I use when I get out there and it's always running mm. when I'm in a, when I'm in a good area, you know, and I'm, I'm investigating, I've got that dash cam running because you never know what's going to do a road crossing in front of you. And just a few weeks ago, someone reported a road crossing in Ocala and too bad they didn't have a dash cam running because they would have had a really good sighting. It was a daylight sighting up there. So I think as people are moving around more through, through that area and through these, these preserves, they're stirring up activity and these, these, uh, these creatures are, are getting stirred up and they're on the move, but right. they have a, a good chance now for the sightings to increase a little bit as, as we're getting back into their territory and, taking back over again. So, mm -hmm. you know, like I said, uh, also Allegheny National Forest, Ocala National Forest, and the Green Swamp, definitely the Green Swamp. I'm right at the back door here. And I plan on a road trip, hopefully very soon, to get up to the Allegheny National Forest sometime this fall and cool. Gettysburg, the Gettysburg Battlefield. I'm very excited to get up there and check that out. So those are my futures. How about you, Amy? Well, like I said, most of my stuff's been canceled, and I was I had plans this year. I was going to be going out to Alaska twice. I was going to be going to the Navajo Nation. So those are out out for now, and and that's okay. Um, I today was my last day of school. I'm heading out tomorrow to a few places in PA, and like I said, I have my maps open, trying to plan some things. But I'm, I'm really excited to spend a little bit more time in Ohio. It hasn't, I haven't had a chunk of time since 2016. That summer, I headed out and I solo camped in Ohio, West Virginia, um, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and New York State. And it was awesome. I spent about a month or so just going around. And, and I'm kind of um, thinking, you know, I have this free time that I wasn't expecting. I'm going to check out some sighting areas. And one of the first places I'm going to go is down to um, southeast Ohio, near, not in Wayne National Forest, but in it. But over this quarantine break, I had a call from a gentleman who said that he saw a green Bigfoot. And I know we talked about that a little bit on our chat. Um, yeah. You know that. It could be it could be some kind of algae or moss like like sloths can get. So I am gonna gonna do go out there and talk to him. Well, you know, <laughs> well, that's 
Well, you know, I, I, I look forward to hearing what you all find or what you come up and your research, uh, you know, um, you're, you're both a great addition to the team and we look forward to hearing what you've got to say about your ventures. And, um, uh, also, you know, we did, we got a question in, in the chat. I want to mention, uh, about these cryptid TV shows. Now, you know, it's interesting, and they're right. There have been more cryptid TV shows in recent years. Uh, though th there had been a few that were that started off at least 10 years ago, but there does seem to be more of it now. Uh, does anybody want to interject and, and give their opinion as to why this is becoming more popular now? <laughs> I was expecting the silence. <laughs> yeah. Because you, you, know, you know you know my opinion on this. So, you yeah, know. It, you know, look, it's entertainment, uh, especially for people that, you know, aren't researchers, don't get out in the field, don't, you know, it's interesting to them. And, and especially during this period of lockup time where, you know, people aren't doing anything. I mean, hell, I get excited if I get to go to Home Depot. Uh, so, uh, it's, um, you know, uh, all the researchers that I can't keep in touch with and, and the 40 and team and stuff, we're, I mean, we're all ready to go. We're raring to yeah. go, yeah. you know, the equipment's ready. The vehicles are ready. The people are ready. And, you know, like uh, get this over with, let's get out there. I don't want to watch anything on a show. I want to get out there and do it. <laughs> yeah. I guess you all, I, I guess Daniel and, uh, Amy kind of feel the same way. Yeah, yeah, I think I it's, you have to remember it's entertainment, and yeah. you know, I I don't I like to watch some of them myself. You know, I think they're fun. You can learn things from them, um, and I think that personally, I think that a lot of people watch them because they may have had some kind of experience, and they want to see people that are like them. You know, yeah, nine I, times out of ten, it's you talk to people, and they say, "Yeah, I had this happen, or I had that happen," so they. They feel like a bond there, I think. Mm. You know, I think, um, I, I think that in a way they kind of, they have kind of given people a, a better reason to come forward with something they've seen. But uh, there, there's a lot of information that's being put out on these shows that's just really unrealistic, to be honest with you. I mean, you know. Of course, when you watch a Bigfoot show and it seems like they're getting, they're hearing this, seeing that every time they're out there. Well, you know, it just doesn't work that way. No, I mean, no, you, know, it's you, not. I wish you can go out it's there not. 50 times and not hear a thing. And then the one time you'll maybe get, you'll hear something or see something. So, um, I agree. yeah, I mean, like you said, the entertainment value is what's stressed more than anything else and believe me i've been involved with these productions personally over the years and it, it's more about making people feel good than to actually presenting the actual evidence or presenting the actual way things do happen but uh you know they do come asking a lot and uh and you guys are new to the team so we're going to get offers we have gotten offers for years now and, uh, you know, maybe something will pan out. Maybe we can go out there and, and do something to where uh, we can kind of give our own opinion. But it's always up to the production company on what gets put out. So, you know, that's, oh, yeah. that's a disadvantage to it. So, uh, you know, I want to thank you three for coming on with me tonight. We're definitely going to do this again. Uh, I, I like to kind of stretch it out and get other people on the team involved with doing these updates. But uh, I, I do appreciate you coming on with me tonight. And uh, you all have a good weekend, and we will be talking soon. Well, thank Thanks, you, Lynn. And Yeah, I, I'm honored to be on the team. I'm excited for a really fun future with you guys and investigating things and I just want to say a quick thank you to everyone who has extended their hand to me over the last three, four years who have given me some great advice and their friendship and really taken me under their wing and, and really helped me out. It, it means everything to me. And I'm very, very grateful for all of that. And 
just thank you guys. I, I, I love y'all. Thank you. We love you, Danielle. And I say ditto what she said. Okay, yeah, guys. Hey, yeah. look, I'm just glad you guys are with us. <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you yeah so much. we we did me and butch just been me and butch and maybe sean that wasn't working out we needed more people <laughs> yeah <laughs> we're happy I'm okay happy we all well, you have a good weekend and we'll be talking soon thank you have a good night mm -hmm. good night good night now if you have an unexplained encounter or sighting feel free to contact me through the fans of monsters blog site now, if you're interested in supporting Fans of Monsters and Arcane Radio, you can use the PayPal donation buttons on the blog or the newsletter. Uh, my new book, Wing Cryptids, Humanoids, Monsters, and Anomalous Creatures Casebook, is now available on Amazon.com. Now, I want to again thank Butch Wachowski, Amy Bue, and Danielle Eau Claire for joining me this evening. And I want to thank you for listening to the show. Good night, stay healthy, and have a safe, enjoyable weekend.